I grew up in Oklahoma, and uh, I was located in Oklahoma primarily because that's where the Indian nation that I belong to is located. Not historically, but where they were removed in the 19th century, and that's the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma. I'm Southern Cheyenne by blood, myself, that's what my heritage is on my father's side, but the Southern Cheyennes and the Southern Arapahoes affiliated for political purposes to form the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma, and that is what makes me a citizen of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma. The Cheyenne historically had a number of important societies, leadership societies and military societies, and there were several of them all together, five in number, but the principle among equals was the Society of Chiefs. And the Society of Chiefs is the Southern Cheyenne Society to which I myself belong. And that is a society to which my great-grandfather, Thunderbolt, belonged. Uh, my great uncle, Elliot Flying Coyote, belonged to it. And then two of my own uncles belonged to the Society of Chiefs. And now in my generation, I belong to the Society of Chiefs. My upbringing was somewhat unique, I suppose. I was raised in Indian country, uh, but at the time that uh, I was growing up from about age four or so until I went away to college uh, after graduating from high school in eastern Oklahoma, I lived at a place called Bacon College, which was, interestingly enough, historically a mission school uh, set up by the American Baptists to educate Indians. It's where my father had gone to school, where he had met my non-native mother, and where both of them were then teaching in the 40s, 50s, and 1960s. And that was my reason for being raised there. So I actually was raised in a, a native environment right on that college campus because 90% of the people there were of native descent or native heritage. And they were from all over the United States though, not just the Southern Cheyenne. On the other hand, uh, out in western Oklahoma were where my families and relatives were located uh, amongst the Southern Cheyenne. And so when I was growing up, even in eastern Oklahoma at Bacon College, we made frequent trips, obviously, back and forth to what was considered the homeland, or the native community, if you will, of the Cheyenne, which was just west of Oklahoma City uh, in western Oklahoma rather than eastern Oklahoma. I think one of the great tragedies has been, in the past, the absence of Native peoples from history. I know growing up in Oklahoma, which had a huge Native population, there was nothing that required that Native peoples be discussed in the history textbooks of that area of the state of Oklahoma. And that was true elsewhere. Now, fortunately, what is happening are two things. First of all, we have the National Museum of the American Indian sitting right here in Washington, D.C that aims very specifically at trying to create educational products that can go into our schools and teach people about the native cultures of this hemisphere, past and present. In addition, I would point out that a number of jurisdictions, including, for example, the states of California, uh, New York, let alone Oklahoma, which I just mentioned, require by state law that historical textbooks used in those jurisdictions and in their schools teach about this vital aspect of Native heritage and American heritage. I think the new millennium continues to bring significant challenges to Native peoples. There's no question about that. Um, and I would look at it from two different standpoints. The first is socio or economic, where at this point, any honest measure of socioeconomic factors in the United States finds Native Americans sitting at the very bottom of the pile in every category one can think of. For the most part, Indian country right now is still comprised of third world economies. That said, I would emphasize that the trend line is going in the right direction, not the wrong direction. If anything, in those same socioeconomic categories, Native peoples are actually making progress, however small, however incremental it may be, but they have many, many challenges to face. The second challenge that Native peoples face is uh, our challenges of a cultural nature. That is their continuing capacity in the new millennium to con continue to be Native and not simply be assimilated. 
And that is a challenge that I think is equally significant to the socioeconomic challenge. Mm -hmm. And it's one that will occupy the attention of all of us who continue to live in the 21st century. This capacity for remaining native, for protecting those cultural values that have so motivated us through time, that have literally held us together, is something that will challenge all native peoples. But again there, I'm pleased with what I see to be the trend line. I know what it was like growing up Indian in Oklahoma in the 1950s, and I know what it's like growing up now in the new millennium. We still have challenges, but if anything, we are more comfortable and see the worth more clearly of being Native now than we did then. What I would say in my case is that I was blessed in kind of a backwards respect by having a father who, unlike me, had had to go through 20 years of schooling in, in boarding schools established by the federal government, the specific purpose of which was to deculturalize Native people. My father survived them against great odds, but it's a part of his life that he would really never talk to me about because it was so horrible for him. It's not that I didn't face challenges growing up, but what I will always be grateful for is that my father, having endured them himself, did his level best to protect both of his sons, my younger brother and me, from having to experience the same kinds of things. I saw the face of prejudice growing up. I can remember going to motels where suddenly there were no vacancies because my father had very brown skin. I know that, but I also know that my father and my non-native mother worked to their utmost to make sure that A, my brother and I, were embedded in Cheyenne culture, and B, that in order to deal with the 21st century, when Indians and Cheyennes would no longer be islands, culturally or otherwise, in this country, they made us two of the most educated people we could possibly be, grounded as a Cheyenne, but able to deal with all that surrounded us. That was their objective. <laughs>